All right. Um, I thought it was kind of neat that the patient was actually from North Dakota. It's kind of near and dear to my heart, so that was, that was nice. Um, I'm going to try to channel some of some of that here. So, um, all right, I'm going to start off with just a little bit of a background here. Um, so, uh, we know that uh, chronic pain has a significant impact on individuals, uh, sig significant others of those individuals, um, and society. So we know that 116 million Americans suffer from some form of chronic pain. One quarter of the people with back pain, chronic back pain, account for 75% of the costs, um, and 10% account for more than half of those costs. Uh, the Institute of Medicine stated that it's a moral imperative that we address the costs and social impact of chronic pain. Uh, so the, the work from the Institute of Medicine actually informed uh, the development of the National Pain Strategy, um, which released their first, uh, or the first draft um, in April. Um, and that contained a very strong argument uh, for multidisciplinary slash interdisciplinary care for patients, and within that uh, included recommendations for behavioral intervention. Um, so I'm excited um, at this stage to be able to come into the pain services department um, and provide some of that care and shape some of those services in Swedish. All right, so I'm gonna, in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna go through and talk about a little bit about theory, uh, some about treatment, uh, and some about interdiscipl uh, kind of weaved in their interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach to pain management. Um, all right, so just starting off, so what is pain? Um, I know it's something that we all um, have a good understanding of, but the definition that we're going to go with here is that it's a sensation, it's interpreted as noxious, and it's a private and or subjective experience. Um, so the model that we're going to focus on um, is the, bio, the biopsychosocial model of chronic pain. Um, so this is a little bit of a shift from the biomedical model. Um, which is a very appropriate model for acute pain, but it doesn't necessarily account for, for chronic pain. Um, it consists of overlapping domains of biological, psychological, um, and social factors. Um, all of these different factors interact to help to determine a person's experience with pain. All right, so Fordyce, um, was one of the original psychologists that started uh, doing work with chronic pain, and he was actually based at the University of Washington. Um, he really argued that it's not about necessarily the pain itself, it's about how we communicate um, our pain through our behaviors um, and, and how those behaviors um, affect one's functioning. So because of my pain, I can't work. Because of my pain, I can't spend time with my family. Um, because of my pain, um, I have trouble doing things at home. Um, so the disruption is initiated by pain, um, but it can be maintained um, through behavioral contingencies that have been developed over time. Um, an example of this is the fear response model of pain. Um, so you can see it can go um, one of a couple different ways. Um, one, the patient can um, have their injury, they have their pain experience, um, they have an adaptive response to their injury and to their pain, so the thoughts that they have about their pain, um, <coughs> they have, you know, um, uh, low fear, understandable emotions that are going on, they confront it, and they have an adequate recovery. Um, it can also go another way, um, so they might um, have their pain experience, um, catastrophize, or have um, uh, over-exaggerated emotions or thoughts um, with regard to their pain, um, leading to uh, fear and emotion about the pain, um, and ultimately uh, start engaging in different behaviors um, like avoidance behaviors, escape behaviors, um, which lead to disuse, disability, depression, um, and it becomes a, a difficult loop for the patient. All right, so I'm going to uh, go through a little bit about um, psychological uh, interventions here. Um, so more broadly, 
Um, if treatment's going to follow the biopsychosocial model, um, it should include um, uh, the physician and PT slash OT for effectively managing underlying pathology and pain, um, psychological interventions to address some of the uh, ways a person is thinking about their pain, their emotions, um, the behaviors that go along with it, um, and also um, altering some of the social contingencies um, in their day-to-day -day life. All right, so I'm going to cover a few different evidence-based treatments, um, or very briefly touch on them anyway. So um, exposure therapy, relaxation training, and cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, it's a little bit misleading here, so um, cognitive behavior therapy actually um, also encompasses exposure therapy and relaxation training, um, but just for the sake of uh, breaking things apart a little bit and getting a little bit better understanding, I'm going to break those up, um, but they're all cognitive behavioral strategies. And then there are also uh, mindfulness-based interventions. And for the sake of time today, I'm not going to, unfortunately, get to cover some of those. Um, some of those include like um, mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, and Carolyn McManus, who's here, uh, does a fair amount of that here and does a really nice job with that. Um, there's also, in a really big growing area, um, there's uh, acceptance and commitment therapy. All right, so exposure therapy. Um, so the idea here is that we're targeting pain um, by systematically exposing uh, the patient to uh, the feared movements and ultimately trying to demonstrate that movement doesn't necessarily cause pain or injury um, and ultimately breaking the pain movement link, movement pain link. All right, so relaxation training. Um, there are a lot of different types of relaxation training. Um, there, uh, we have um, uh, progressive muscle relaxation. We have uh, diaphragmatic breathing. There are also exercises called autogenic relaxation. Um, and depending on time and how we're doing, um, might actually come back to a diaphragmatic breathing exercise um, and go through one at the end with you guys. Um, with regard to social contingency management, I don't, um, I don't know if you guys can read this or not. Uh, I'll just read it off for some of you who might be further away from the screen. Uh, it says, the pain starts in my husband's lower back, then it travels up the spine to his neck, and then it comes out his mouth into my ears, and that's why I get these headaches. Um, so it's, it kind of pokes fun at it a little bit, but it's really important to think about um, what's going on in a person's environment, um, what's going on at home, how, how their significant other or their family members might be responding to their pain, um, and, and also their relationships with their medical providers, what's going on there. All right, so over time, um, uh, a person's negative thoughts and beliefs about their pain um, and their behavior um, with regard to their pain can become really resistant to change, which is um, especially for those of you that work with uh, chronic pain patients, uh, I think something that you probably experience. Um, so it's really important to bring awareness to some of these cognitive behavioral issues um, and provide them with tools to, to help to cope with some of those issues. Um, so what I want to do is just uh, we can go through a little bit of an exercise, uh, hopefully with you guys, and come up with um, an example model of, of what this looks like. Um, so as you're working with your patients and um, you, hear, you hear them express certain thoughts um, about, their, about their pain and uh, what it means for them, what are some of those things that you guys hear that you feel like um, are barriers for them or the expressed thoughts about their pain? Okay. Yep. Yep. My pain was caused by a surgeon. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yep. So something exactly uh, like sticking on this idea that something has been missed. Well. Perseverated on anything kind of. 
Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, so I've uh, put down a few few examples here too of common ones that I hear. Um, so I can't provide for my family. Uh, this is never going to end. The the being stuck on uh, there being something there. Imaging. That's a really common one. Um, I can't do anything. Um, okay. So um, when we think about those thoughts, what types of emotions do you think commonly pop up for pop up for patients? I hate my surgeon. Pat? <laughs> <laughs> but not as much as my pain doctor. <laughs> That's good. That's good. All right. So we all can get along here, um, but but I don't believe in psychology either. So. <laughs> All right. So a lot of a lot of things that we hear commonly, you know, or see: uh, depression, uh, worry, um, panic, um, both over time and and um, with specific reactions to to their pain. Um, and what kind of um, when we think about maladaptive uh, pain behaviors, what kind of things come up for? Or do you notice? I want to go back to my surgeon for another operation to fix it. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Um, and yeah, so all those things uh, we see that possibly staying in bed all day, staying away from friends, uh, taking more medication than pres than is prescribed. Um, so we know that all these this model becomes pretty complex, and all these uh, different areas play off each other. And we need to have a good understanding of this, what's going on for the patient, in order to to help them to be able to move on move forward. Um, so just a few uh, elements of this treatment that's, that are important. Uh, it's necessary to have a skilled psychologist, so that it's not necessarily you know, the uh, regular, kind of, regular kind of anxiety or depression. Um, a lot of these thoughts and behaviors and emotions are really, can become really ingrained for the patient. Uh, the cell is really important, so making sure that um, they're buying into the treatment. Um, setting achievable goals um, so that they can experience some sense of reinforcement um, and to get them going again. Rapport and trust. Um, being able to monitor um, the skills that they're acquiring um, and be able to adjust as necessary. Um, um, having them not necessarily focus exclusively on pain, which uh, can be a big challenge in treatment. Um, getting them to, to expand their world a bit a little bit, thinking about other things, doing other things. Um, so um, I, I put the, the model back down here um, and included um, a list of some of the possible um, skills that we might be going through depending on, depending on the patient. Um, and you can see the, that that list of skills really mirrors the cognitive behavioral model. Um, so we're addressing um, and providing tools with different ways that they think about their pain. Um, we're providing them tools with uh, what they're behaviorally doing, and we're giving them tools to, to cope with and deal with the emotions that they're experiencing um, as related to pain and um, in general. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to go through um, just a little bit of evidence here. So evidence for psychological treatment for pain um, is strong. We see evidence for decreased uh, reported pain, uh, improved pain coping, and skill acquisition, uh, reductions in behavioral expressions of pain. Uh, we see increased functioning um, and uh, increased reports of um, improved quality of life. And um, also very important, we see reduced healthcare costs, both at um, individual um, and system levels. Okay. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time going through any kind of questions that you guys. Have.